Ezra chapter 4, I want to read for you one verse and then give you a little context and then talk to you about the philosophy of the college. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, Be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee, uh, thee to us are come unto Jerusalem, building the rebellious and bad city. They're speaking of Jerusalem. And have set up the walls, therefore, and joined the foundations. Now, it's sort of odd that we take a text in the middle of a group of people here that are really ratting out Israel. Uh, they are upset. They are opposed because Israel is rebuilding the city and they're trying to get them in trouble, just like some of you tried to get your siblings in trouble when you were growing up. And they come and they basically say, look, they're building this horrible city. But the thing that I want you to pay attention to is at the latter part of the verse, what they're saying is true and have set up the walls thereof and joined the foundations. A foundation had already been laid and what was Israel doing? They were rebuilding, they were building walls, they were connecting the foundations. And so when you see in building, uh, when you look at building, there's foundation that's laid and then the walls have to go up. And so my intention this morning is to remind you a little bit about the foundations that were laid many years ago by Brother Comfort. And I want you to know that it's our job of our generation, it is our job to build the walls upon those foundations. Uh, very, more frequently than I care to admit, many ministries, churches, colleges, whatever, uh, seem to falter in the second generation. It's sort of like if you do a study of second generation wealth. I remember years ago, Dr. Dave Bond, who's now with the Lord, one day in class, he said, I'll tell you an interesting study. He said, do a study of second generation wealth. And you'll find that many times that wealth is squandered or those people abuse it in such a way that they cannot perpetuate that wealth to go from generation to generation. And I find that ambassador is in a place and ministries are at a place where sometimes the second generation comes and they squander what was given to them by the first generation. And so this morning I want you to listen carefully as I talk about building the walls of ambassador. And back in New Old Testament days, walls usually had two or three purposes and I think those purposes are well served today as we talk about building the walls of ambassador. Uh, walls are good back in Old Testament times and even today they are good for defense. Uh, you know, back in, in the day of Joshua they didn't have uh, Patriot missile systems that would home in. Of course, they didn't have uh, missiles at all. You had to worry about the shoot down to start with. But the main, the main act of defense by a city was walls. Those walls were constructed high and it was to fortify the city. And it's important for us to build the walls of ambassador because it will defend us from false doctrine. It will defend us from making mistakes that will destroy the foundation of the school. Another idea that walls were built for identification. You could look at a city from a distance and you could tell what city it was by the walls that were there. Uh, they would say, look off in the distance and say, there is this city or there is that city. There's Jericho. And you could identify a city by the walls. Well, you can identify a college by the walls that are built uh, on the foundations that have been laid. And so with the idea of defense and the idea of identification, I want to take a few moments and I want to talk to you about Ambassador, what I believe the school is all about, and that you'll embrace it and that you'll help me to move it on another year on the same foundation. Now, uh, for just a disclaimer here, Ambassador is all that I have ever known. Uh, I came to Ambassador in 1992. The school was entering its fourth year. Uh, I think the first four-year graduating class would have uh, taken place that year. But in 1992, I came as a freshman, and I had never heard of Ron Comfort, uh, until I learned about Ambassador Baptist College. Matter of fact, I never met the man until I first came as a student, and I was stunned at how short he is. <laughs> and uh, I had visited the school in April of that year. I'll never forget Charles King was preaching a message on saying a good word. I've never forgotten it. 
And in that message that he preached that day, he was talking about how that David was speaking at the funeral of King Saul, who tried to kill him repeatedly. And instead of venting to the world how much he hated Saul and all of the wrongdoing that Saul had done to him, Saul tells the crowd that Jonathan and Saul were lovely and pleasant. And he talked about how that David had a heart of forgiveness, how that David apparently was willing to overlook that and that, you know, so many people today are filled with hostility and bitterness. I'd never forgotten that message. And when I left campus that day in April, I knew that that's where God wanted me to come to school. And I came that following August. Now, I realize there are some of you, when you came to college at Ambassador, you came by force. Your parents told you this is where you're going and then you came and then you figured out this is where you needed to be. But for me, it was one of those things. God had called me to preach. I didn't know exactly what area. And uh, so I came to Ambassador in, in fall of 1992. And so I got to see Ambassador in the early, early days. I got to see it with its founding faculty. Uh, I got to see it when it did not have facilities like this. Uh, I'll be honest, I think about you dorm students today. What you have now is a lot different than what I had years ago. As a matter of fact, I will tell you this. If we had today what we had back then, a lot of you would have turned around and gone home. You say, what do you mean? When I came in 1992, I walked into a dormitory. You know what my dormitory was? It was a house. It was a residential house that had been gutted. Carpet had just been thrown on the floor and there was nothing else in there. No beds, no nothing. And I walked in and they were like, you're going to be staying in that room. And I thought, well, that's nice, but I hope I have a bed. And the beds were in a building, uh, the shed that was next door, and it was old army beds that had been donated to the school. They were made of the heaviest metal known to man. And they were, at least the rack above me was just filled with rust on the springs. I still remember my first night in the dorm, I laid there, and every time the guy on top would roll over, rust would just sprinkle down into my face. And, uh, but you know what? There were 28 of us in that house with two bathrooms and two showers. 28 of us. And do you know that whole year I didn't hear a complaint or anything and we just made out like it was the best thing in the world. It was a year that I'll never forget. But you know since then the Lord has blessed us with a lot of things. All you've known is an auditorium that's air conditioned. Uh, back in those days there was no air conditioning in the auditorium. My graduation was in the last graduating class in the Shelby campus and it was no graduation with hundreds of people packed into a gymnasium. They had large um, trash bins filled with ice rigged with fans that were trying to blow the cool air just to cool us off. And that night I was wearing a robe and I probably lost 20 pounds at graduation. <laughs> you know, back in those days, uh, it was a little bit primitive and God has blessed us so much when I look at it today. And God has given us dormitories. God has given us, given us a campus that we can call our own. He's given us classrooms that aren't crowded where they're climate controlled. Uh, there were so many things that we didn't have back in those days. But while God has changed our facilities, and to be honest, I'm glad that He has, there's one thing that can't change, and that's our philosophy. And that is what I want to talk to you about this morning and give you some things along the way. So let me share some things that are key to this school that need never change. Number one is we've got to always have a single focus, and that's the ministry. Ambassador has always been a Bible college with a single focus, and that single focus is the ministry. Now, schools have adapted and schools have changed over the years. They've changed their approach to this. Uh, there are some schools today that not only now offer ministry majors, but they offer uh, majors in other vocations, other occupations and uh, yet still call themselves a Bible college. I think that's very hard to do, and I'll tell you why. 
Because as a Bible college, at least what I've seen in our existence and also in the existence of others who have made those changes in those early days, listen, it's hard to have a single focus when you've got other things uh, that are distracting you. And here at Ambassador, when you're in a four-year program, you're going to be in a ministry major. Why? Because this school is about ministry and that is our single focus. You know, it's interesting in our day and time, there's become a greater emphasis on bivocational ministry. Now, let me make a few disclaimers as I wade out into this minefield, all right? I know it'll be carefully scrutinized. Listen, I do believe that there are probably many churches in America, the only way that a man is going to pastor it is to be bivocational. When you get into smaller places, I'm sure that that is the case. And there are some people that cite Paul as the bivocational ministry model. And they say, well, look, the Apostle Paul was bivocational. And I would also contend with people that when it comes to your preparation, that yes, Paul was bivocational, but Paul was a tent maker before he ever got saved. And that was a trade that God gave him, and lo and behold, he's able to take it and use it later on in ministry. I'm not here to say that bivocational ministry is not a possibility or reality in our day. But I will tell you this. When you go into your ministry training with a bivocational attitude, you can mark it down. You're going to get less Bible and less practical experience. That's a fact. And sometimes people go in with the idea, I'll be bivocational. And before you know it, they're an accountant and they never make it to the pastorate. One of the reasons Brother Comfort started Ambassador is that his heart was grieved to see people go to Christian college with a desire to serve the Lord in ministry and then never make it. Why? Because they were distracted. And so I'm not here to tell you that one day you're going to serve the Lord and that you will never have to work another job. I was just talking to one of our students or our graduates. She's a teacher, but guess what? This summer she's going to be working a job somewhere. I'd say she's bivocational. But there's no doubt in her mind what the main thing is, and that's her teaching ministry. And so here we want to maintain, we're not a liberal arts school. And the day that we ever try to be is the day that we leave our foundation. We're a Bible college, and we have a ministry focus. Let that be your focus. When you're in the dormitories, you dream with other kids about serving the Lord. Maybe, maybe it's on a mission field or maybe it's as a school teacher or a preacher's wife. But that has to be our focus and we're not going to change. Not only a school with a single focus, but number two is a strong Bible curriculum. A strong Bible curriculum. Now there's a difference between a Christian college and a Bible college. A Christian college, all Bible colleges are Christian colleges, but not all Christian colleges are Bible colleges. And what I mean by that is there are are several Christian colleges today that are liberal arts schools. Now, this is not a message against liberal arts. I'm just telling you that if you're going to go into ministry and you have a liberal arts core, it's going to cut your Bible down to about 30 to 32, 36 hours of Bible. And that's just a reality. That's just a fact. But here at the college, instead of having a liberal arts core because you're training for the ministry, we want you to have a Bible core because we believe there's no better book to prepare you for the ministry than the Bible. And it's my goal, it's my promise to you to take you from Genesis to Revelation book by book in the classroom. Now, in order for that to happen, every teacher has to complete their curriculum and they have to complete their classes. One of the things that breaks my heart is to hear a student say, yeah, we got through the class and the last class the teacher handed me three books of the Bible that we didn't cover in class. Now, I don't hear that very regularly, but when I hear that it breaks my heart. And here's why, because I feel like I've broken my promise to you or I feel like they've broken my promise to you. We want you to complete the material in the classroom. That requires discipline and it requires sometimes taking your rabbit trail questions that you ask in class because you don't want to study and throw them to the side and get done with the material anyway. Some of you teachers know or some of you students know what I'm talking about. There's some of you there, you're like you can count on that person to ask a rabbit trail question. But we want to take you through the Bible. Um, And by the way, for those of you that came from Bible institutes, 
Listen, Bible institutes are a good thing. But you know there is a difference between Bible institutes and a Bible college setting. You say, what is that? It's this. In a Bible institute, you don't, you're not able to spend as much time going through a book as you would in a classroom. That's not a knock on Bible institutes. I'm just saying they're not equal. They're not one and the same. You sit in a Life of Christ class, you're going to be in the class two or three times a week Whereas sometimes in a Bible institute, you may spend an hour a week and finish a 16-week curriculum. Listen, it's not apples with oranges. There's more time that's spent in your time in the classroom here. And it's important for you to understand that. Every major is going to have at least 60 hours of Bible. We're not going to cut down Bible. Did you, do you know that there are accredited schools, and I'm going to say more about this a little bit later, who have been pressured by their accrediting agencies to cut Bible out of their programs? That is a fact. And here at Ambassador, the answer is not to cut out the Bible curriculum. That is the core of the school. You know, one of the distinctives about the school is the use of the King James Version. And here at the college, we use the King James. We don't use any other. In our doctrinal statement, you'll hear us say that it's the best English translation. Now, I know that's very disputable in some people's minds today. But here at the college, we use the, the uh, Textus Receptus, the Hebrew Masoretic text in our language classrooms, and we use the King James Version. And people say, why do you do that? Because we believe that these texts are where God has preserved His Word and we believe with the King James it's a translation that we can trust and we can rely on without reservation. Now I'm going to tell you what's happening in some of our Christian colleges today is I'm afraid we've raised up a lot of critics about the Bible. And for some people, they'd say, well, you can't really understand the Bible unless you have three or four different translations. And who knows what you're supposed to read from when. Listen, I don't want a college that shakes people's confidence in the Bible. I want it to be able for the people in the pew to hold the Bible in their hand and say, this is the Word of God. That's important to me. When you sit in a Greek or a Hebrew class or you sit in a faculty member's class and any of them tell you time and time again what's wrong with the King James Version, you come see me because I want to know what's wrong with them. And we live in a day and time where it's very confusing. There are more people that are going to the ESV. There are more people, listen, they, they go to various versions, the NASB and the message and everything else. But listen, here at the college, it's not an issue. It's not a debate. We're, our position is very understood. And I want you to know, students, you can have faith in the Bible that you hold in your laps. You ought to study it and you ought to live it. I find there are many people today, they bicker about some all, all kinds of different things. And I thought, well, regardless of what translation you have, if you'd live it, it'd change the way you act, you know. <laughs> but that's where we're at in the Bible. You say, what about people in other languages? Well, listen, if they're not speaking English, we want to get the Bible in their language. And there's translations that are out there. I'm not an authority on all of that. But it's important to have the right source and to have a faithful translation. And that's what we try to teach you in general Bible introduction. And that's what we try to model on this chapel platform. A strong Bible curriculum. A third thing is an experienced faculty. It's important to have people listen... If we put career academicians in the classroom to teach you how to pastor a church, we've done you a great disservice. I don't want somebody who's not really seasoned in ministry teaching you to do the work of the ministry any more than I want a surgeon who was trained by somebody who was never a surgeon but he knows a lot about anatomy. You understand the difference there? Listen, I want a man who can tell me more than just where my gallbladder and appendix is at. I'd like for him to say, I've been there and done that, and I was taught by somebody who has as well. But one of the things that happens in colleges, and sometimes it's a cost-cutting measure, is they take a graduate assistant who's made some really good grades, and he's a 4.0, and he's going to teach you pastoral theology? Well, I dare say you put him in a baptistry, he may not even know to check the level and consider the weight of the person before he fills the baptistry. He wouldn't know what he's doing. 
Somebody comes to you and they're like, hey, I'm going to teach you how to do ministry, but they've never known what it's like to sit across from a parent and hear how their family is broken and how to put it back together again. Listen, there's a Bible patterns. It's Paul's training Timothy's, Elijah's training Elisha's. Brother Comfort believed that in 1989. I believe it in 2022. I remember years ago I was talking... Uh, to a student who was at a, 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 you know, a well-known Christian college. He was a missions major. And I remember asking that gentleman, I said, well, your missions major, I said, who's your teacher? And he told me. And I said, oh, I've never heard of him. I said, where was he on the mission field? And Brother Ashley, he looked at me and he said, well, actually, he's never been. And it was hard to find Brother Ashley. It took two years for us to find a seasoned missionary that was willing to come off the field and teach college students. And when that fellow told me that, I'm going to tell you, on the, outs, on the inside, when he said, well, he actually has never been on the mission field, on the inside, I went like this. <laughs> but on the outside, I went like this. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's called being polite. Now, some of you, you're like, well, I'll tell you, when I think about a college, you know, what's their gym like? Well, I'll assure you of this. We're the only college in America that has a carpeted gym. That makes us unique, doesn't it? One of these days we're going to change that. But you can't judge a college by a carpeted gym or how many ping pong tables they have. And we're probably the only one that has a carpet ball table too. You say, why do we have a carpet ball table? It prepares you for camp ministry. You want to minister to junior age kids? You've got to play carpet ball. Go do it. But I'll tell you, one of the most valuable things that you gain in a college, it's not so much all the physical amenities, but it's who's teaching you. And we try our best to put together a faculty that's going to teach you from experience and teach you faithfully in the Word of God. Not only experience faculty, but another thing is the position on the local church. This is probably one of the most misunderstood aspects of our ministry. And there are people that criticize the school and they say, well, the college was not founded uh, out of a local church. Now, it's ironic that those same churches will support missionaries with mission boards that weren't founded out of one specific local church, but I'm not here to point out all the inconsistencies. You're right, the college was not founded out of one particular local church, but we have to realize this, that we are a college, we're not a local church. And because of that, we can't exert authority over local churches and we ought to be a servant to our churches in the area rather than a master. And we, you know, it's delicate when you're trying to work with 25 different independent Baptist churches within a two-hour radius. But can I tell you, God has given us some great men in this area that are able to invest in you. And when you come here, there's a reason. We give you six weeks to pray and look around. But when you, after that six weeks, we want you to be settled into a church and then you're there every time the doors are open. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Now, we may not require you to join that church, but we do tell you a couple of things. Number one, that's a decision you've got to make in conjunction with your home pastor and your parents. But number two, your opportunities to serve in a church well, may very well be limited if you choose not to join that church because a church has certain liabilities and responsibilities and that's left up to the churches, but you have to factor all that in. But when you come, we want you to be committed to a local church and we want you to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meeting the week that projects are due. You know, for some of you students, you're like, I, I can't believe this. We have a revival meeting. Listen, you know what Pastor Davidson does? Pastor Davidson schedules revival meetings at Maranatha and like weeks that I have home. I, I don't, he doesn't check my schedule. But you know, when I'm out one week and I'm out the next and the week I'm home, that's the week of revival meeting. Well, guess what? That's the week I need to be there. It's commitment. And sometimes commitment stretches you a little bit. But you're going to be stretched. Commitment to the local church, that's important for you to understand. Being there every time the doors are open, it grieves me. There are people in your generation and they say, well, 
you know, I'll tell you what, I'm a little bit bothered. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to go to church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And, of course, if you're at Emmanuel, you don't even go to church on Sunday night. But anyway, that's a different story. Now, for those of you watching on live stream, listen, that's not a cheap toss at Brother Ogle. You're just, this is a family talk. But you know, there are some people and they say, you know what? They say, if you, don't, if you don't have service on Wednesday night, I mean, nowhere in the Bible rather does it say you have to have church services on those appointed times. And you know how I answer that? I look at them and I say, you know what? You're right. That usually throws them off. You're right. Nowhere in the Bible does it say a 10 a.m. service and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 7 p.m. on Wednesday. You're right. And usually most people that use that line of thinking, they just like to confine it to one day and one service and get it over with. And I look at them, I say, you know what, as a matter of fact, when I do a careful study of the New Testament, you know what I do find? There's two definitive things that I find. Number one, the church did meet on the first day of the week. And as a matter of fact, when I read a little further, they met every day. And then usually they leave. You know, for each church, they decide when is the best time to have their services. But in all of our churches where our kids are committed, listen, there are pastors that believe in having church and they're committed to discipling believers and they're committed to reaching the lost with the gospel. That's the kind of church we want you to be in. Listen to me, if you're going to lead in a local church one day, you've got to first of all learn to serve in one. And so you understand that in the local church, I love the advantage that you have here. You know, most of you, all of you, should be able to have personal contact with your pastor. There's not not 500 of you in a line waiting to see Brother Ogle or Brother Davidson or whoever your pastor is. You should be able to have personal contact with your pastor. You should have the opportunity to be involved in a variety of ministries. And you can find a church size that's comfortable to what you're used to ministering in. You know, undoubtedly, you're able to get settled into a church. I tell people, pick a church like your home church. I know there's no place like home. But still yet, there's so many advantages to being in this setting. And God has blessed us with a number of good men. And your local churches, there's something that we expect all of you to be involved in. And it's called soul winning. There are a number of you, when you came to college, you were never really exposed to a systematic Uh, visitation program or exposed to -to door-to-door calling, uh, those types of things. And one of the reasons we teach you personal evangelism class is because one of our goals is for you to get out of here and to give the gospel. And you have that avenue in your church visitation programs. Churches do it differently. They have different visitation programs. They have different methods of attack. But be involved in it. Throw yourself in it. Be committed to it. The local church, it's very important. Another thing here is a family atmosphere. We want it to be a family atmosphere, but you cannot take by default that because something is smaller, that means it feels like family. As a matter of fact, there's several things that I want to just sort of push here a little bit to tell you that when we lose these things, we lose a family atmosphere. Um, Let me give you several things that I heard Brother Comfort say. I'll give you these phrases. You can write them down. Number one, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Now I realize that whenever I go to a church or I go somewhere, sometimes people say that's the president of ambassador or if I stepped into a dormitory this afternoon unannounced just to check it out, people would snap to attention because I'm the president of the school. And while I understand the respect factor, here's one thing you have to keep in mind. I put my shirt on just like you do. I put my coat on just like you do, one arm at a time. And yes, it is good to have respect, but we're not here to worship people. It amazes me the rock star worship that takes place sometimes in independent Baptist circles. I mean, even the Apostle Paul, when they thought he was divine, he said, I'm just a man. And some of us preachers would learn to do well and respond the same way. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. You respect your teachers. But you understand that all of us, you know, we're made with feet of clay. 
Another thing that Brother Comfort talked about is he said there's no superiors or inferiors, only equals. No superiors or inferiors, only equals. And again, that plays to the idea here, listen, the ground is level. You know, you know why we have the faculty members eat in the cafeteria with you? Because we want them to rub shoulders with you and we want you to understand that, you know what, we're, we're just people trying to help you as God has helped us. We don't want to create some kind of hierarchy where you have the teachers here and the students here. And, and there's several things that we do to try to encourage that. Let me tell you another thing that really gets me sometimes. This is sort of a personal pet peeve, but since it's my chapel service today, I can express it. It really bothers me when I see somebody treat me with great respect and then they treat somebody else like dirt. That really bothers me. When it's all smiles with me, but then they berate somebody else. For all of our staff, listen to me. I want to encourage you. You treat your fellow staff and you treat those that you're over. Listen, you treat them with respect. And to our students. You know, I don't want it to be something when I'm talking to you that, uh, you know, and all of a sudden Dr. So-and-so walks by and I says, listen, I'll talk to you later. I'm, no, 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 no. That, that should turn a student off and it would turn me off. Listen, you respect people for their time and you devote your time with them. And, but listen, don't, don't get in where you treat authority one way and you treat your classmates another. If I treated students in a lowly manner and I just left them hanging whenever another faculty member came by, that would turn you off and I can understand why and it should. But don't, don't kowtow to people. That's what Brother Comfort used to call. He said, don't kowtow to people and be political. Just be who you are and be respectful and be polite to everyone no matter their position. Now, here's another thing that Brother Comfort said, and I want to illustrate it for you. He said this. He said, the student is more important than the rule. The student is more important than the rule. Now here's where some of you are like, I like this. The prisoner runs a prison. That's not what I said. I said the student is more important than the rule. You know, sometimes you've got to have common sense. For instance, I was an RA in the dorm. I know what it's like to have to deal with people who come in after hours. I know what it's like to hear the excuses of why the bed wasn't made. And I could tell you some good ones. But let's say I'm the RA and that, the next morning I come in and a guy's bed is a mess. I mean, an absolute mess. He's gone to class, but his room's a wreck. And I go through that night or I go through that morning and I'm like, that's it, man. I'm going to lay him out. I mean, that's just pretty obvious. He's just really messed up. And so then later on that evening, and by the way, RAs, can I tell you something? If you write somebody up, talk to the people that you write up. Touch base with them. Don't hide behind a demerit slip. That's convenient to do. And so that night I go to the individual and I say to him, I say, Sage, we'll just use, we weren't classmates, but we'll just pretend here. It makes me feel young if I'm your classmate. And I'm like, Sage, your room was a wreck today, so that's it, man. I wrote you up. Matter of fact, I wrote you up for two or three things. And Sage looks at me and he says, you know, he said, okay. He said, I just got news this morning that my grandmother was in a coma. Just totally unexpected right before I went to class and I just froze up and I didn't know what to do. And I just, I, I tried to go to class, but I just let everything go. Can I tell you something? The student's more important than the rule. At that point, I throw it away and I sit down with him and say, Man, how are you doing? We were really close. I mean, I've never, I've never lost a grandparent before. At that point, I don't care about a major housekeeping violation. You have to learn how to do this. It's called compassion. Now, there's some of you that you say, oh, I need a lot of compassion. It's like because you presume on people's mercy. All right? 
Mercy should not be the rule. Mercy should be the exception. I mean, that's why it's so special, right? When you get it. But the student's more important than the rule. You know, there were times when I, I came into a situation in the dean of students' office where, yeah, you're right, the person, the person just totally fell off the map and didn't do his dorm job for a week. And then I found an underlying problem. Well, at that point, instead of laughing at you and saying, well, you're getting 50 demerits, man, 10 a day. Boy, I'm telling you, but now let's talk about it. You know, sometimes when you find out somebody's having a problem, listen, instead of going by the letter of the law, you need to back up a little bit and realize that maybe because of your lack of awareness, you weren't able to help that person in a timely fashion. Shoulder some of the responsibility of yourself. Meet them halfway and show them that you have a heart. The student's more important than the rule. Now, there are situations you get to where certain rules are violated where you don't have a choice. You, you, you make a statement to the entire student body if you choose to tolerate certain things. But I'm just saying when there's background issues, when there's things that are running in people's lives, listen, it's more than just demerits. I know some of you think the dean of students' office lives for demerits. Their life would be a lot easier in some regards if we never had to enter them. But I want to tell you, that there's going to be times where we find the root cause and we say, let's back up, let's talk about this. There's other times where discipline has to be administered. One of the hardest jobs in this school is what Roger Lucan does, hands down. Without a doubt, I've been there, I've done that. When you have to tell a parent, I'm sorry, but your kid's got to go home. And you've tried to think of every other way for that not to happen. I'm going to tell you, that bothers him and it bothers me. Whenever you're dealing with somebody and they're not forthright and your heart is heavy and you're gone somewhere and you're, you're just like, wow, you know, this is, uh, that's all you can think about. Listen, the burden that that man bears, I'm going to tell you, none of you know uh, what he has to deal with. And you know what? I'll tell you this. I know our student body's imperfect. I know that our dean of students' office is imperfect. I know that the administration's imperfect. But I'd like to think that all of us are trying to seek the Lord and do what's best for one another. And I can say that without a doubt. But in the dean of students' office, Brother Comfort used to tell us when you discipline somebody, how would Jesus discipline that person? Not only that, but if my child was being disciplined, how would I want it done? I wouldn't want you to be publicly humiliated. And then what form of discipline will promote the greatest opportunity for restoration? It's all about getting you on the right track. What can we do to you to help get your attention to get you on the right track? That's the philosophy that we try, we try to employ. But let me give you one last thing. We talked about a family atmosphere and there's other things. That, but I really want to park for just a moment on the matter of accreditation. Now, I'll have to come back another time and talk about conservative music, but I want to deal about this subject of accreditation. Every student that comes here is well aware that Ambassador is not an accredited institution. And we make no bones about it. We don't try to throw little certifications. We've been certified by the Bird Watchers Association, and we've been certified by the people who think they know the Bible Association to try to give you some air of accreditation standing. But I want you to understand there's a reason this school's not accredited. And by the way, the major Christian colleges that are in existence today all held our position 25 years ago. That's undisputed. Or 30 years ago. Maybe I'll back it up just a little farther. But little bit by little bit, student, Christian colleges have become accredited. Now, that's their business. But I'm going to tell you why we're not. Do you know that right now in the Joe Biden administration, there is an active movement within the Department of Education to revoke what's called a Title IX exemption that has been granted to Christian colleges and their desire is to force Christian colleges to hire transgender and same-sex attraction people. That's happening right now in the Joe Biden administration. 
If the Biden administration had their way, they would revoke that exemption for West Coast, Pensacola, Bob Jones, and any other school out there that is accredited. That's what the Department of Education wants to do. That is what they're actively working on every, every, every hour, it seems like. Every, every so often, Brother Lucan and I are on a conference call with other Christian colleges and AACS, and we're hearing about what's happening in Washington, D.C. And you understand, these accrediting agencies, they are approved by the Department of Education. The Department of Education sets their minimum standards. And those accrediting agencies, whether they be Christian or whether they be secular, they're all enslaved and they're withholden to to the Department of Education. And at the college, we just make up our minds, I think I would rather have the approval of local churches than the federal government. And I'll tell you, schools that are attached to local churches I think are on dangerous ground with accreditation because they have given a whole wing of their ministry to a whole level of government approval that no other ministry in their local church has. And I believe there's a great danger, there's a great battlefield in religious liberty. And it used to be that we all steered clear of it because we didn't want to take money or our students take money from the federal government. Well, now that's changed. There are many students today, they take federal loans, they take federal uh, government funding. And there are some schools, although I wouldn't say that there'd be many, but there'd be some schools that might take federal funding themselves. But listen, when you build a student body that becomes dependent on the U.S. government, and a, a school ever has to forfeit its accreditation, which is a gold standard selling factor to many of their students, what do you think happens to the school? It implodes. The cash cow is gone. You know, you've probably already gotten word from Brother Bunn that we, you know, we, we're going to implement a tuition increase this next year. And if you haven't, happy Easter because that's what's going to happen. <laughs> and I will tell you this, I don't delight in that any more than anybody else. But I'm telling you what I have to learn as an individual and what you've got to learn as a young person preparing for the ministry, you have to trust God to pay your bills. And I don't say that lightly. I don't say it lightly at all. But what's happening with these accrediting agencies, I think there's two things that have been violated. Number one, for those that do it of a secular sort, I believe it's a violation of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, being unequally yoked with believers. For a Christian college to yoke itself with an education philosophy in so many places that has God forsaken. It's a dangerous place. Not only that, but I believe according to in the book of Romans where it talks about marking those with contrary doctrine. I believe that even in Christian organizations, listen, you have Christian colleges that are independent Baptist colleges that through their accrediting agency are yoked with charismatics and others that have doctrine that's contrary to this book. And so as a result, Ambassador Baptist College from day one has chose the same philosophy about accreditation that was espoused by Les Olala, Bob Jones III, and others. And we retain that position today. We believe that although times have changed, those principles are important to guide us. Some people say, well, my, my, my degree is useless if it's not accredited. I ask some of our graduates that. Is it really accreditation? Is that what makes you a pastor? If it does, your focus is wrong. I think it's a calling in your preparation and the approval that's been put on you by a local church. Listen, that's what counts. And if you're here and you're like, well, I'm preparing for a secular occupation. Well, I'm just telling you, ambassador can't give you all those credentials. But I'll tell you what we can give you. We can give you the Bible in large quantities and give you practical training for the ministry and get you ready to go. And then when you leave this place, we want you to go and turn the world upside down with the gospel.